So in this section, we're going to transition from our last lectures, which were mostly about descriptive models for spatial statistics, to now talking about how do we actually build uh, spatial covariance into uh, actual process models and data models in order to fit models uh, to spatial data, and particularly going to focus on how we spit fit models to uh, point referenced data. In general, there's two different approaches we could take here that are directly analogous to what we did in, the, in time series models. Uh, the first would be to uh, do what we did with uh, autoregressive models, where we constructed a covariance matrix uh, as a function of distance and time and used that in some larger multivariate normal, you know, large covariance matrix. Uh, on as the error term on uh, another on, on our process model, um, <clears throat> and you know this what in this slide I'm calling Bayesian Krieging, though we'll also see there's a maximum likely way of doing it. But the basic idea is taking what we learned in Krieging, but then applying that to actually modeling the covariance matrix in any uh, error model. Uh, would also like to point out. For reference, that this idea is also the special case of what's called a, a Gaussian process model, which is the kind of n-dimensional generalization of Krieging, where you have you know, the potential for covariance structures in more than two dimensions. Uh, you, know, you could have a three-dimensional spatial model, or you know, in my group, we actually use Gaussian process models frequently to, to approximate uh, things in, in higher dimensional conceptual spaces like uh, parameter spaces or, or state spaces that are larger. Uh, one of the important things about this idea is that we are going to be including the parameter error explicitly in our predictions, in our modeling, uh, as well as you know, explicitly you know, including spatial covariance in our modeling uh, and fitting everything at once as opposed to this kind of piecewise approach that was using traditional Krieging. Uh, the other approach to, to spatial modeling is, is very much analogous to our state space time series models. Uh, and so if we think about a, a say a two-dimensional analog to that, uh, that would uh, you know, be what's known as a mark of random field models. So to start off, I'm going to start with these, um, these spatial covariance models. So in the, the, the basic form of a spatial model uh, is to envision that we have some response variable z at lo some location x that is predicted by uh, what's here called the trend, but which we would have, you know, throughout the rest of the semester, we've referred to this as the process model. So our process model make, predicts the expected value of our process at some location s. Uh, that could be a constant mean, that could be a linear model x beta, it could be a generalized linear model with some you know, nonlinear link, it could be a, some broader not class of nonlinear models like we covered uh, multiple times through the semester. You know, it's, so this is the same, everything we've been talking about up to now about you know, fitting process models that applies here. Uh, at the other end is the residual error. That's just uh, what we've always assumed you know, some model describing the residuals, in this case, you know, might be a normal with mean zero and some residual error tau. And, you know, in reference to what we learned previously in, in Krieging, that would be equivalent to the nugget, the, the, the uh, additional variance that occurs at, at zero spatial lag uh, that is not explained by spatial uh, heterogeneity itself but is associated with other forms of variability and stochasticity. And then in between, we have this, this spatial error. Um, and we're going to model that spatial error as a multivariate normal distribution, uh, mean zero, again, assuming that that error is unbiased, uh, but with some spatial covariance. Um, and specifically, uh, that, that spatial covariance uh, will be a, a covariance matrix where the covariance uh, between any two locations i and j is a function of the covariance of you know location you know, z a location i z a location j uh, where we're making the assumption that that is just a function 
of distance. So that assumes isotropy, that it depends on distance but not direction, and second order stationarity, that it just only depends on distance in space, not where you are in space or um, any other higher statistical moments. So we're making this assumption, uh, uh, yeah, that covariance is just a function of distance, not direction, and, and that the, co the covariance length does not change with direction, does not change with where you are in space. Those sorts of things can be relaxed uh, in more complex spatial models, but this is where we're going to start for now. So if that's how the approach we're taking, uh, the key to this, you know, the new thing here is this spatial covariance matrix, because obviously we've talked about residual error and process models throughout the whole semester. So where does this uh, spatial covariance matrix come from? So the idea being, like we said, if we fill in this matrix for every element of the covariance matrix ij is a function of distance between two points in space. And then we're going to break that down like we did for time series into the into a, a variance component, sigma, and a correlation component, where that correlation component depends on distance and some set of parameters phi. Um, and so now, like we saw with time series models to calculate the covariance matrix in space, uh, we need D, which is our uh, pairwise distance matrix. It's the matrix of all pairwise distances between all of our points in space. We had the exact analogous matrix in time series models where they were just the distances in time. In the time series models, those would tend to be very simple because the distances tended to be like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, but it, in spatial models, those distance matrices are going to uh, be much more arbitrary because you're calculating the distances between points. Uh, and then next we need a correlation function. Uh, and correlation functions are the exact same ones that we talked about when we talked about the descriptive forms of, of you know, fitting models to uh, variograms or correlograms and uh, you know, using functions there uh, that were fit separately in a traditional Kriging process. So here we're not going to fit them separately, you know, we're going to estimate the parameters in them, the sigma and the, the parameters phi, as part of uh, fitting the overall model, but we still need to make a choice about what correlation functions we want to use. Uh, so examples here are the exponential correlation function, the Gaussian correlation function, and this more flexible um, a turn function that has uh, multiple parameters, you know, a phi and a v uh, and a k. Uh, and worth reminding you, you know, what I said back when we talked about uh, traditional Krieging, which is not all functions that you could write down to describe correlation, uh, which would, you know, in a symbols form, just is a function that is bound between minus one and positive one. Uh, not all functions that meet that constraint are actually valid correlation functions. And as I mentioned previously, uh, you need the, this correlation function to lead you to a positive definite covariance matrix, and that proof is, is non-trivial. So like I, I recommended previously, it, you know, when we're modeling spatial covariance, um, did we use correlation functions that have already been kind of proven to be valid uh, as, as spatial covariance mo models? Um, Choosing between these, you might still do the sorts of exploratory approaches we talked about earlier, where you might fit a correlogram and you might, you know, construct a correlogram and, and and kind of in an exploratory mode see which of these performs best. But then when we move on to uh, building our full spatial model, we're we're going to actually you know refit that as part of the full process model. So the other key part here. And, and this is really, I think, a really important general insight. And in fact, I would say both the last slide and this slide uh, lead to a lot of, uh, you know, just really important general concepts uh, that show that this concept of modeling covariance matrices, you know, writing down parametric models that describe the elements in our covariance matrices is a general concept uh, that can be applied uh, to time series models, it can be applied to spatial models, and as we'll see here, it can be applied much more broadly than that. 
um, to any place where we have a concept of, of distance. And the idea that our correlation would be a function of that distance. Um, so like I said earlier, this distance matrix is our matrix of all pairwise distances. Uh, and it's important to note that those distances do not strictly have to be Euclidean distances. The most common form of distance in a spatial covariance matrix would be Euclidean. You know, you, you, know, you have points on a map and you calculate the shortest straight line distance uh, between them, but other forms of distance matrices are valid. So, you know, here we see, um, you know, a, a kind of the, the sort of distance matrix you would have gotten from a traditional uh, map atlas, in this case covering uh, parts of Canada, where you have distances between uh, locations, and those distances between locations are not actually the Euclidean distances between uh, those locations, but they're actually the the driving distances along roads. And that that would be an example of a perfectly valid uh, covariance matrix, uh, you know, a distance matrix to go into a covariance model where you know, if you believe the process that's connecting these locations is not one of pure spatial distance, but one of, you know, uh, driven distance, then this would be the distance matrix you'd want to use. You know, there's also ideas of like, you know, uh, it's called a Manhattan distance, which is, you know, you know, distance along X plus distance along Y as if you had to move on a, on a grid or, you know, had to move on streets that were set up in a grid. Um, and we can generalize this concept of, of distance uh, that we're using in time series and spatial models, like I said earlier, to any situation where correlation could be a function of distance. So you could imagine you could build a, a, a phylogenetic model where you have some uh, distance matrix telling you how similar species are in phylogenetic distance, where you might have uh, some graph or network showing how different things are connected to each other in a food web or in a social network or in you know, anything like that, and where you could say, I can calculate something that represents the distance between, say, individuals in a social network and model the covariance structure uh, by calculating a distance matrix and then estimating a function of how the correlation, say, between two individuals in a social network breaks down as a function of distance in that social network. And that would be a perfectly valid distance matrix, a perfectly valid covariance matrix, and a perfectly valid way of accounting for, in this, you know, for example, unexplained uh, correlations in a social network um, that, is, that are not explained by, our, by the process model. And remember, the goal is always to have the process model uh, sop up uh, the actual variability. And actually that leads me to, uh, I guess, one final point I want to make on the conceptual conceptualization of spatial models. And this is coming from a point of, of personal experience, which is uh, always approach them by modeling the non-spatial model first, you know, model the process model, uh, model, you, know, you know, describe the data model, you know, for that residual error, and see how that performs. If, if your process model explains all of the variability in your process, such that there's no autocorrelation in the residual error, then you don't actually need a spatial model, even though you have spatial data. Because if, if, all, of your co if all of the pattern in your data is explained by your covariates, uh, then that's great. That's, that's ideally what we want to do. We use spatial models not to model spatial data, but to write down models where spatial distance is explaining uh, covariance that we can't explain by the process itself. And so, you know, I would always recommend starting with the non-spatial model and then, you know, evaluating the residuals in that model to see if they are spatially autocorrelated. If you do find spatial autocorrelations in the residuals of a model, or if you find temporal autocorrelation in the residuals of the model, then you definitely need to uh, account for that using the approaches that we're talking about here. Thanks. And uh, so that wraps up this lecture. And the next lecture, we're going to start looking at how we'd actually implement these things in uh, R or JAGS.